Thank you for joining us for the PEDCAC Podcast, a weekly information security show featuring some all-around good people. It is week 39 of 2021, and this is episode 26. That means we've been doing this podcast every week for the last six months. I'm Chris Louie, and with me, I have my co-host Brian Deach, who just paid his taxes like good citizen. What's up, everyone? Yes, thanks for uh, airing out my dirty laundry there, Chris. I, I paid my quarters like a, a good citizen and happy to do so. And the always traveling Glenn Medina. Where are you at this week? <laughs> hey, uh, I, I'm in uh, Southern California in, in Costa Mesa. I'm loving the weather here. It's a little bit of overcast and uh, not so bad. It's, I think it's in the uh, high 70s, low 80s. And uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Happy to be back for podcast number 26. And like I said, things have cooled down in California, at least uh, where I live, because it's always cool where Chris lives. Very true. This week, we have Matt Disher of Disher Solutions as our guest. Matt, would you like to introduce yourself? I would. Uh, So I am Matt Disher. I actually work for Zscaler. Disher Solutions is my cover, my stage name, right, for my demos uh, and previous consulting life. Happy to be here. Funny, funny story about Matt. I, I saw him at a company event one time. I was like, dude, what's up, man? Uh, thanks for all your help with, with data security and this, that, and anything, giving me access to your VM. And the guy just looks at me. He's like, what the hell are you talking about? I was talking to Matt Hager. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Got my guys confused. <laughs> yeah, Both Matt's. a lot of Matt's at Zscaler. A lot of Matt's. There's a surprising number of Chris L's, too. Uh, I remember when I when I signed on, and there only when I signed on, there were only about four hundred people at the company. And then there was this email sent out, and it's like, oh, yeah, Chris L is going to be responsible for this. And it was like my second week in. I'm like, wait, wait, what? I'm going to do what? <laughs> and then it turns out it was Chris Leach. Um, and then after that, I think we've gotten one or two more Chris L's on board. And thanks signing you up for everything, bro. Yeah, right, right. But but your but your Chris L as in Louis with an E, not an S. Not an S, like people keep spelling it that way. Yeah. <laughs> hey, what's your uh, not the French way? What's your middle name and mother's date of birth again? <laughs> <laughs> what was your first car? <laughs> first pet's name. Yeah. What street did you grow up on? Have you guys seen all those like Facebook things? Like people like put them out there. Like, hey, what what street did you grow up on? LOL. And people are writing on there. I'm like, oh my god, you can't possibly be that dumb, are you? Well, the the good one was like the tw- there's like the twenty or the thirty questions that you have to ask like first love of your life, first teacher's name, um, school that you went to, and I'm like people are actually filling this thing out. How dumb can you be? Well, that that's why we have an information security awareness month. We have a whole month to dedicate to training people not not to do things like that. Yeah, it's the grandmothers and mother in laws though that aren't subjected to. Great right. week awareness. Not the Deach household. They got to do it. I don't care who you are, how old you are, <laughs> anywhere, any place, anybody. It's like death and taxes. Well, the Deach household. And security training. In the Deach household, when you connect to his internet, he asks you to install a certificate. Guess why, people? <laughs> False. That's actually Glenn's house. <laughs> <laughs> and Glenn's just projecting. Well, Matt, it's great to have you on, and thank you for joining. Combined, we have decades of information security experience and are here not just to educate, but to entertain. We've got four awesome stories for you this week, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Now, Matt, when I talked to you and asked you to come on this podcast, you said your passion is smoking meats, barbecue, and RV maintenance. What can you tell our listeners about one of your passions that might surprise them? Hold on. Before you answer... I want to know what the difference is between smoking meat and barbecue. And that's got to be an Eastern thing. It it is, I think. The difference is is in the eye of the beholder. I think if you're really going to smoke the meats uh, and you're going to take your time, you're not just going to throw it on a pellet grill and push a button and walk away. I think um, while you're smoking it, uh, it it doesn't have all the same love and care, right? doing injections, making sure you pull it at the rest and wrap it and slather it with, with goodness. Right. It's, it's, it's between, it's turning it up to a level 11, I think. Gotcha. Um, You know, your question 
tell me something that folks would probably not expect. Uh, there's two things, right? So with meats, it's really not as hard as, as it sounds. And there's a couple of great books out there. Meatheads, uh, Science of Barbecue is critical to, you know, dispel a lot of the myths about barbecue because uh, there are a lot of them. Uh, other than that, I mean, just have fun with it. Uh, but RV maintenance, RV maintenance is a pain in the you know what, and it's expensive, but it's not hard. Do it yourself and you'll save yourself. A is it safe to is say that? Is it just like a car, but go ahead, Brian. And say, is it safe to say you didn't choose RV maintenance? Uh, RV maintenance chose you? Oh, no, you, <laughs> RV maintenance chooses you. I mean, it, and people don't realize, I mean, it, it's basically a rolling earthquake, right? So pick up your house and roll it down the road. Stuff breaks every trip. That's the nature of the beast, right? So... Um, yeah, sadly, it's, it's, it's the cost to play. So I, I always thought it'd be, doing, you will be doing maintenance. Yeah. I always thought it'd be like buying a car, but magnified because everything's so much bigger. It is that it's heavier. You can't pick it up. You can't jack it up. You know, you're going to a truck stop basically, or a freight liner to get the chassis worked on as wow. opposed to your Ford dealership. Wow. Um, and then, you know, it's all the things that your house has, right? The appliances, refrigerator, water heater. Um, so my, my heavy duty three and a half ton floor jack is probably not going to work is what I'm hearing. Uh, the RV sitting in my driveway weighs 40,000 pounds empty. That's what, 20, yeah. 20 tons. Yeah. You'll need, uh, you'll need a couple of so those far. jacks, Glenn. So, so do you have the pop outs? Do you have everything that we can make that the new podcast uh, location, right? So the rolling should, podcast location. Ro- yeah, yeah. Yeah. I have to bring it out West. Um, yes. So yeah, three slides. And so it's, it's, it's basically a rolling Marriott. Man cave. It's, glamping. it's not, it's not camping. It's clean. Yeah. Yeah. So do you turn that into your office when you're not, um, when you're at home? Not yet. Uh, because internet access out there is kind of sketchy. Gotcha. My wifi won't reach out there. Sounds like it's cantena time. Exactly. Pringles. <laughs> <laughs> We just alienated a bunch of our audience. I have no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put a disclaimer in the front. It says, if you, if you want to get into the tech stuff, fast forward to... There you go. All right. On to our first story. This week, we have a number of arrests to talk about. We've often talked about the inability of Western authorities to arrest cybercrime members overseas, especially those hiding in China and Russia, since they do not extradite their own citizens. It looks like one of the members of the TrickBot crew got nabbed in South Korea. He went there for what's believed to be a vacation around March 2020, and guess what? He got stuck there due to COVID lockdown restrictions. During that time, his passport expired and he had to renew it, so he had to go to the Russian consulate. And over a year later, he was still there, but in the meantime, while he was in South Korea, The U.S. Department of Justice handed out an indictment for this traveling fellow, and the South Koreans picked him up at the airport. Surprising absolutely no one, he's currently fighting extradition to the U.S. Separately, the authors of the Mozzie botnet were arrested in China. Yes, I did say that cybercriminals were arrested in China. This is surprising because China has a tendency not to prosecute cybercrimes so long as they do not target China or any Chinese interests. Personally, I see this as a step in the right direction. We've tried economic sanctions, we've tried improving our cyber defenses, but I think until we have these criminals in handcuffs, they're going to continue to operate with with what they believe to be impunity. This also rebuffs what some people uh, are who are critical of the Justice Department say when they say that you know in, indicting these ghost figures will will not do anything. Well, it just so happens that this guy slipped up, it was stuck in South Korea, and we were able to pick him up based on this this DOJ indictment. So these criminals just have to slip up one time by visiting a country with an extradition treaty with a Western nation, and we can nab him. So he did two fundamentally wrong things, right? So number one, like we knew who he was, so like poor opsec on him, and then two, who the hell vacations in South Korea? I don't understand that. I, I think some, this guy did. <laughs> I think yeah, there's some pretty cool guy. I, there's some pretty actually cool places to go in, in Korea or South really? Korea. He might he might be a huge like BTS fan or a Psy fan and wanted to see Gangnam maybe. 
two things that are not on my my list of top billion things to do yet again yeah i I hear the the 7-elevens in asia are really cool right so think of a 7-eleven here in the u.s where you go get gas over there it's like a five-star meal service um awesome as far as the amount of and quality of the food that you can get inside a 7-eleven and then the bathhouses over there are just ridiculously awesome so from the standpoint of going to a sauna or a sauna day i'd rather go there than head up one of the spa days here on, in california so when it comes to food and me traveling especially like for work i i'm notorious for dropping in at a 7-eleven and, and picking up a cheeseburger dog I've talked about this before uh, internally. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, wow, gourmet food at a 7-Eleven. I might be in heaven. All right, maybe there is a reason to go to South Korea. Yeah, check in the Google. It looks a pretty safe place to visit, too. It wouldn't make my top 20 list, but maybe I'll have to move it up on the list a little bit. Is it humid there, or is it all seasons? I don't know. It, it, my understanding, it gets really cold over there, especially in the wintertime. So it's, uh, it, it can snow. Well, you think think about it. They're they're south of the thirty eighth parallel, and once you're in the thirty eighth parallel, you're in the tropics. For so, yeah, but remember, there's elevation there as well. So yeah, yeah, true. Spoken like a true army ranger over here. <laughs> I'll neither confirm or deny that I've been in in Korea. So. <laughs> well, you you guys are in luck since you don't have any. Department of Justice indictments there. You you can visit South Korea and not have to worry about getting nabbed by, by some foreign authority. I, I think we would have got nabbed here, Chris. <laughs> I, I actually... So that, that brings up a, a, a different point. So what about the opposite? So let's say I'm, I'm a U.S. citizen. I work for the NSA and I've hacked into, in call it an Iranian nuclear power plant. So if I go to Iraq for some reason or another, can the Iranian authorities arrest me there for cyber crimes against Iran? I don't think they bother to arrest you. I think they just eliminate. Yeah, <laughs> you get you get banned, right? You get thrown I think in you would van. just get banned here in the U.S. <laughs> you know, just thinking like, how cool would it be if like Chris is actually behind that? Like, I know if I was part of that hack, like I would have just told everybody first at Thanksgiving, right? To all my friends and family, like all the cool stuff I did. <laughs> eventually, gets on Twitter, like the entire world would know. I'd have like that, that's just too too big not to share. Yeah, you just paint your own target on your back. That's actually what they, they say. So there's the so I think when you work for the NSA, you say I work for the Department of Defense and you leave it at that. And then I think they actually give you a cover story of what you're supposed to say, you know, if, if somebody grills you about what you do. So you have this, you know, I guess the official cover and then what what your real day job is. You you don't necessarily tell people, say, Yeah, I, I hack other governments for on behalf of the US. Well isn't Jack Ryan, isn't he like a historian or something like that? Is a college professor, Fair isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it, it depends. So Jack Apple's, Ryan's yeah. been reinvented many, many times. The latest one with John Krasansky on Amazon, I think he's a State Department logistics provider, but he's also been a professor. He's also been, uh, I remember, there, there's Harrison Ford, there's Ben Affleck. Uh, I'm trying to think if anyone else portrayed him, but yeah, he's, he's something different every time. That's right. Are there as many Jack Ryans as there are Bonds? That's the question. Dan, I, I don't I know. There are now. Cause, yeah. Yeah, there might be. That's good trivia. We'll, we'll have to look that one up. All right, but I guess it's safe to say, stay on the right side of the uh, the government. And if you hack into someone, don't go to a country that's friendly with the government that you hacked into. Or just make sure your passport's not going to expire, right? I mean, that's really <laughs> the fundamental problem here is, is, is credentials expire. Yeah. Yeah, it's cutting just close an yeah, alias. in COVID. Like Deech. Yeah, just use an alias. You could be Deech for the day. I'll be Duke Silver. Yeah, Duke, <laughs> I'll Duke Silver. Duke Silver online. All right, on to our next story. I read this report last week, and I didn't think too much of it, but this story, it, it stirred up quite a lot of controversy online, so I thought it'd be worthwhile to talk about on on the podcast and see if I get your guys' view on this. ProtonMail is a privacy-centric encrypted email service hosted in Switzerland, and they advertise that no one except for the mailbox owner can read the emails. So you log in, 
with your username and password that gives you access to the mailbox, but then the mailbox is then encrypted again with a password that only the user knows. They're also located in Switzerland, so they have very strict user privacy laws and can typically rebuff any law enforcement requests for information similar to the secrecy that used to bestow Swiss bank accounts. I use them personally as my email provider because I like their privacy-centric approach and I want to support them. For almost a decade, their users have enjoyed these privacy protections, but with strong privacy comes potential for abuse. Ransomware attack crews have taken advantage of that privacy and they use Proton Mails as a mean for victims to communicate with them since Proton Mail does not have the ability to hand over the plain text emails to the authorities. Now, the problem and controversy came when a Swiss court, and this is important, a Swiss court ordered Proton Mail to turn on IP address logging for one of their users. A French law enforcement agency asked the Swiss government to issue the court order to get the IP address information for a French climate activist wanted for some crimes in France. Now, Proton Mail had no choice but to comply since the order came from a Swiss court. Worse yet, they were also hit with a gag order, preventing them from notifying the user that they were under investigation. Proton Mail has always denied court orders from foreign governments, but just not from the Swiss government. What happened was Proton Mail turned on logging for this one mailbox and got the IP address data handed over to the French authorities, again under court order, and the criminal was arrested. This represents a precedent and fundamental shift in Proton Mail's policy, so much so they actually removed a line from their website which stated that they will never collect your IP address information. That was one of the things that they advertised on the website. No, no logs, no IP, no snooping. Uh, but now they can't say no IP anymore, so they actually removed that from the website. It, that's interesting because it wasn't like it was a Swiss citizen. This was a French citizen and asked by the French government. The French government actually asked the Swiss government to, to, to indict this person or pull this information. Uh, and I take it because Proton is in Switzerland, uh, because the request came from the Swiss courts, that's, that had to be obliged, right? So what would prevent the U.S. from going to Switzerland and saying, hey, I want you to, you know, do the same thing that you just did? I don't I think, think there's anything. anything. That prevents it now, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think the cat's out of the bag. Yeah, that's, that's why they had to remove it from the website, because now there's been this legal precedent that's a, set. That's a slippery slope. You would have thought they would have held their ground on that one. I think they did. Like, they... they they went on on Reddit and on their official account on their official subreddit, and, and they, they laid it out pretty well. And, and they said, yeah, unfortunately, we had no choice but to comply. There was no way for us to appeal this. We tried every legal trick in the book. But in the end, you know, we, we can't defy a court order. Did Reddit sound like a, a, bunch, like a group of Karens just complaining, or were they just like sympathetic? Proton Mail has a pretty loyal fan base, so they were, they were definitely concerned. <clears throat> And I think that was justified. I think there there was reason to be concerned there, uh, but I think they were, I think they were understanding. I think the the important thing was Proton Mail was really transparent about it and said this this is what happened. This is why we couldn't tell you know the person that they were under investigation, and they they were sort of like wink winking like they they didn't tell they didn't explicitly want to tell you how to evade it. But there were people commenting that said yeah well if if you use a third party VPN or if you use Tor. Oh, Proton Mail only gets that address, and the guy's identity would have been protected. So, as part of the opsec, so even if you can't hide your IP, or Proton Mail will record your IP from now on under court order, you could still use Tor, you could still use a uh, third party VPN, and that would hide your IP address. They get the IP address, and then the Swiss authorities have to subpoena the the Tor server or the VPN provider, and then that. Whether or not they can trace that back to you is actually up to the to that particular provider. So, how do you feel about this, Chris? I know you use it. Are you going to look elsewhere? I don't think so. I, I still believe in their their mission. This is it's it's starting to chip away at some of some of that that privacy. Um, so, I use the Brave browser. It's a privacy centric web browser uh, based on Chromium. And actually, I notice when I do visit you know protonmail dot com in my address bar, it says, it gives me an option, open this website in Tor. And I have not seen that on any other website. I visit hundreds of sites a day. 
And no other website that I know of has that button that says open this open this uh, web page in Tor other than, than Proton Mail. So if you have reason to believe you're being tracked or somebody's after you, use Tor, use VPN uh, as, as an additional layer of security. Yeah, I think that's the moral of the story, right? If you're a known criminal, you've got stuff in your past like Brian does, you need to make sure you cover all the bases. Jack Ryan, not, so not Brian Deach. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Brian's high school teacher trying to get get back at him from hacking into the the, the grade the grade uh, record system. Whatever, come on, Mister Ziegler, bring it back. I don't even care. Let's see what you got. <laughs> I ain't scared of you. You ain't my dad. But I think fundamentally, though, contents of the email, all that was still protected. Correct. Yes. Yes. So they just they just connected the dots. Yeah. Exactly. Helped them locate the individuals. So. So uh, fundamentally, at its core, Proton Mail said what they did, what they said they could do and would do, right? Yeah, exactly. So the the emails are still protected. There's no way to get into them unless the user provides the password for them. And they they actually have pretty they actually have very good security because if you ever forget your mailbox password, they said, okay, yeah, we can reset your password for you, but you're never going to be able to read all those old emails you have because they were encrypted with your old password so i think it's the encryption is is good it's strong and i don't think there's any way to get those emails unless the user gives up their password it kind of goes back to like i don't know if you guys ever receive like the uh the dmca violations in the mail like you're downloading something you probably shouldn't have i remember getting on the the phone with uh my isp they're like yeah you were doing this i'm like i don't know what you're talking what's an ip address like i just have open wi-fi at my house man they're like oh okay we're sorry this is how you secure it and you know shame <laughs> on you like it's that whole like i didn't know defense works sometimes especially for grandmas <laughs> what's that song that we were talking about wasn't me yeah the, the shaggy, shaggy defense yeah shaggy defense the shaggy defense <laughs> So Deech said, well, technically it was me. I just didn't, well, he, he said it wasn't him, but yeah. uh, he, he said it was my internet because I have open Wi-Fi. Yeah, whose fault is that but now? What what they say to you to that? Because they, they, they'll say ultimately it, it's your responsibility to secure this. Someone's using your internet connection to you know, abuse these services. Like you're still responsible. What was, what was their response, your ISP? So back then, now this is probably, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago if not longer, it was, it was literally, well, this is how you protect your Wi-Fi and prohibit that from happening again. But at the same time, uh, I had a friend who was doing similar thing with like the Pirate Bay and he owned it. He's like, yeah, man, I was downloading 90210 for my, my girlfriend and whatever. They're like, okay, well, uh, for the next two years, we're going to be watching you and everything that you do. And if you do this again, you're gonna have heavy legal fees. So just be careful. I guess what you say. I know, I know a guy that admitted to it and ended up paying like ten grand in fees and fines. Wow! And he, Ooh. he, he, he. I'm like, they can't prove it, dude. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, and I think most of that ambulance chasing has been abated, right? Something's changed, and because of the Deech scenario, you can't really prove who did it. Yeah. I remember doing that and I would run a VM inside of my computer. And then as soon as I was done, I, or if I thought something was going on, I would just delete the VM. So that would be like, Hey, there's all nothing to, on there. I don't know what you're talking about. All you yeah. really had to do was just block the upload, right? Like you can download all you yeah. want. It, so that was back in the day. Yeah, that's where they get you. Firewall where it, it failed. Like it literally stopped working. And that's how quote unquote, somebody on my network was caught. Yeah, because I think it's it's they can't prosecute you for downloading it. It's sharing it. It's the upload part yeah. that they get you on. So yeah, you could do that, but then your ratio would go down, and then you get kicked off any any kind of tracker if you're not sharing. Right. It. Says no, the that, expert. That takes, too long. takes too long to download it. Right. <laughs> or so I've read. So I've read. <laughs> With streaming and everything now, it's so easy just to get the content you want without having to, you know, download it illegally. For the most part, I know one guy that still does it, and it makes me scratch my head. But whatever. <laughs> Not on this call, obviously. Obviously. Well, let's be real. There's some things that are not on a streaming service today, right? You get those legacy movies that 
that you can't find. You gotta go get them from somewhere where you can get them. Not that I've done that recently. That might be true. I, yeah, I've actually read on through my thorough research for this podcast, I subscribed to some subreddits and one of them happens to talk about piracy. And they they put forth an interesting argument that even I think like in Amazon's terms and conditions, this is even if you buy it, like I say, I buy this movie for 15 bucks. It's mine to keep. Like Amazon says, we have the right to stop hosting it. We have the right to you know, revoke your access to this without any kind of recourse. And that's when the arguments for piracy, it's like, well, hey, I, I pay this. There was a social contract that I could keep it forever and watch it whenever I want. And now you're saying you could take it away from me for any reason you feel. And that, that was one of the arguments they put up, which I thought was, I think it's valid. Like yeah. There's a, some kind of social contract. If I hit that buy button, that's mine to keep. If I buy a DVD, no one can take it away from me. But if I buy a digital copy of this, you're saying you can take it away from me at, at any moment. So how is that different? Yeah, it's, that's interesting because I, 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 that's pretty much consistent across all of the service providers, right? All the content providers that do that. They're like, hey, we can take this away at any time. What's, what's even interesting is like I had canceled my Comcast service for a little bit and went AT&T. And what they told me was, hey, you had actually bought some movies. So even though you do not have a Comcast account with us or a, a, a subscription service with us, you still have a login to Comcast can, can view those movies anytime you want. And I'm like, okay, great. I'm going to log into Comcast and watch the two movies that I accidentally purchased. <laughs> <laughs> but they, I, I guess Comcast lived up to it. So that was actually pretty cool. You know, yeah. you know what really pisses me off is like the streaming services – Anytime it's like the holiday season, all of a sudden, like, uh, let's say Christmas movies, they just magically disappear. The only way you can get a hold of, like, the greatest Christmas movie ever made, Die Hard, is to actually rent it or buy it. You know what I mean? Or The Christmas Story or Home Alone or something like that. But uh, that's one thing that always kind of makes me fire up the old Plex server so I can rewatch the movies I already own. That's big media. Vast conspiracy. That's right. All right, for our third topic, it's going to be our Apple story of the week. So this week, Apple made, made major headlines twice. One was the annual iPhone announcement, where Apple showcases the latest models of its flagship phone. The term major headlines is actually being generous here, since all we got was a better display, better cameras, and more 5G. Fun fact, if you spun off just iPhone from Apple, it would be the 15th largest company in the world by revenue. The other announcement that came in the form of an emergency security update to iOS, iPad, OS, Mac OS, and Watch OS to patch a zero-click remote code execution vulnerability being actively exploited in the wild. It is unusual for Apple to release a software update so close to the anticipated release of iOS, which I think comes out next week, but this bug was so bad they had to push out an emergency patch. In episode 23, we talked about the software company NSO Group, which creates the Pegasus spyware. Pegasus allows governments, law enforcement, and intelligence agencies to remotely take over someone's phone, steal emails, steal text messages, turn on the microphone, turn on the camera, track the user, among other really creepy things. The challenge is how to get the Pegasus spyware onto the victim's phone. Researchers from, researchers from the University of Toronto's Citizen Lab, also discussed in episode 23, they're a watchdog group promoting digital freedoms and civil liberties, and they discovered Pegasus spyware installed on over 30 phones belonging to journalists and political dissidents. After a thorough investigation and some forensic analysis, Citizen Lab discovered a zero-click remote execution bug with Apple's OSs and responsibly disclosed it to them. Zero-click remote code execution vulnerabilities are the most dangerous because a user does not need to be socially engineered to click on a link or open a file. Just merely sending the malicious file to the victim is enough to compromise their device. NSO maintains that they only sell their spyware to track terrorists and save lives, not to spy on journalists and political dissidents. I think they're obligated to wink every time they make that claim. Now, this exploit is not world-ending, since me personally, I do not believe I would be the victim of such a targeted attack. 
However, now that the patch is available, it's only a matter of time before non-state actors figure out how to craft the vulnerability themselves and just start using it for mayhem. But it's fixed now, so you don't have to worry about it. It's, it's, it's fixed if you patched. <laughs> <laughs> So what what do all of these devices have in common, right? That it would be an exploit across all four of those devices, I guess is the first question. And then like, how are you sending the file? Is it like uh, AirDrop? Is it a text message? Um, is it just visiting a website and it's downloading, you know, a piece of JavaScript? Like, what do we do? We actually know. Yeah, I think it's a website visit, and it's JavaScript or similar. Was my understanding when I read it. Yeah, it had to do with the PDF parsing engine, that there was some vulnerability in that. So if you visit a website and it does some type of drive-by download of the PDF, or if like I send an iMessage to you with some spam that says, hey, you know, the, your, your FedEx delivery, we missed you. you. Click here for the invoice. You don't even have to click it, but you know, it, it seems innocent enough that you're receiving a PDF from, from FedEx or, or whoever. And once that's dropped in your phone, you know, bam, remote code execution. That's pretty cool. I didn't know that you can actually read PDFs on your Apple Watch, though. But Safari's on the Apple Watch. Yeah. So that's the piece. Yeah, Safari and iMessage. Although, on iMessage, when I get a message on my Apple Watch, sometimes, like if someone sends me a picture or a link, sometimes it shows, and then sometimes it says, go check it on your phone. So I don't know when it distinguishes between the two, like if it's based on bro. size or... It's got to be a size thing. Yeah. Size matters. So you gotta get the new the new Apple Watch. That way you can just get rid of your phone and your laptop. Just do everything from the from your wrist. Yeah. One millimeter bigger. But it's forty percent more screen real estate, right? I, I'll be honest with yeah. you guys. <laughs> I, I would I would totally get rid of my phone if I could have my iWatch read my emails to me. Probably an accessibility yeah, feature could, to I, do that. And I, I bet and you. I could dictate. And I could dictate. Yeah, I would totally get rid of my phone because I, I like I, I like going for runs without my phone with just my headset, and it's very freeing not having to have that thing clunking around in my in my pocket, right? And still have but people access. But aren't me. you doing that so you don't get the notifications and the emails and all the things you just wanted to three D? Mm, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that means you're still too connected. Yeah. So. On the, on the note of privacy and stuff, and this is where you might have to start editing out on our podcast or at least bleeping me, I cannot tell you guys how livid I am. Like all the Alexa devices have been yeeted from the Deech household. Uh, we were sitting in the kitchen and uh, like we had this kind of chaotic day and I told my wife, I was like, hey, I think I'm going to go to sports clips real quick um, to get my beard trimmed up because I look like I was literally on the brink of discovering fire. She's like, okay. And then my daughter goes, hey, dad, Alexa wants to know if they want you to find a local barbershop. Oh, we no. even say it or anything <laughs> like that. Like, within, like so fast. I would say within three minutes of the conversation in the kitchen. And I, I was just, yeah, I was pissed. So did, Actually, looking did you really at your, your beard. Did you, did, yeah, start there. Did you get rid of all your Alexa devices completely? We did. Uh, the kids have one in their bathroom because my daughter likes to have concerts in there. So, like, what's the... Uh, and, and there's no screen on it, right? So she likes to listen to music. I'll let her have that. But, yeah, the rest of them are gone. If you do trust Apple, yeah, HomePod is an alternative. That's if you trust Apple over Amazon. True. Everyone, Which I think I do. I would as well. I just... Uh, so the the one that was in the kitchen is the one that had like the screen on there, and you can do recipes and stuff like that, like and play videos and watch movies, and you know, it was kind of cool. But yeah, it's gone now. I spiked it like a football. And I think we've talked about this before. The difference between Apple and all other big tech is Apple is not an advertising company. They make, as as far as I know, Apple makes zero dollars on advertising. Like you could promote stuff in the App Store, but they don't market to you. But you think of Amazon. Amazon's fastest growing division is is advertising. Google, Google is an advertising company. Facebook, you know, Facebook Portal, they are an advertising company. So that's why the big tech has a profit motive to market to you. But Apple, Apple makes their devices or Apple makes their money because their devices cost like fifteen hundred bucks, and yeah. they don't have to worry about s selling well, ads. They make their money off of the 
iStore ecosystem, and I think 85 to 90 percent of the apps are to do nothing but deliver ads, right? So <laughs> okay, fair. That's, um, I mean, they're you know at arm's length, but yeah, no, they 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 feel advertising. So you guys saw like what happened on the note of advertising and how Apple makes money, right? So Epic Games, the creators of Fortnite, they they decided, you know what, we're, we're tired of paying the VIG to Apple. We're going to do our own in-store payment uh, so kids can, you know, get their V-Bucks so they can play and get different characters. And Apple completely removed them from the, the App Store because they were not getting their cut. And so App, uh, Epic took them to court and they didn't necessarily win. It felt like the... Uh, the, the law kind of aired on Apple side, although it looks like you're going to have alternative payment methods here in the future when it comes to some of the, the in-play games or in, in-charge games. Did you guys see any of that? Yeah, that was a huge story a week ago. That's all that was on CNBC that day was this this Apple versus Epic. Um, I'll let you guys talk because I have my, my views on it as well, but I'll let you guys go. I love it. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I actually play Fortnite. It's one of the ways that me and my... Uh, one of my daughters and my son and my uh, daughter's boyfriend, we would actually just kind of sit around and play. I wasn't any good, but when you, as you get kind of older, you the the best part of your your life is the memories that you have, right? And for me, one of those memories that came up while watching my daughter play Fortnite the other day was when she was literally, I think, like nine or ten years old, and she would play and play and play, and she's just horrible, right? Just couldn't get a kill at all. And then one day, you know, she's you know, it was in my office playing. Uh, by herself and all of a sudden you just hear this screech right and she runs running out to the living room she's like i got my first kill like you know is this to see her so happy right like it, you know it was a, like and, a proud papa moment yeah and, and now she gets like 23 without even trying but back in the day like it was one of those things just to see her kind of overcome overcome that i thought it was pretty cool so is that the new um pushing your kid with a bike and letting them pedal on their own moment for you <laughs> no i still <laughs> push them with the bicycle i taught them how to swim uh but yeah it's just i'm, I'm kind of weird i feel like i'm getting kind of like i'm sure disher and uh, you probably relate to this with you know you haven't married off one of your daughters and whatnot or maybe more than that i have no idea but you just you just reflect back and those those memories are like really what you kind of hold on to it's kind of weird yeah absolutely yeah, that I, or you're I, training them for esports. Like you're gonna be an esports star by the <laughs> time you're 16. You're gonna win me millions of dollars in prizes. That would be like yeah, telling them, "Honey, you're gonna be lucky your entire life." No, I'm not trying to set them up for failure, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a similar moment as well as that, right? So my daughter asked me to help her record a TikTok, and and I thought, okay, great. What's a TikTok? But sure, I'll help you record it. And uh, she went from like 50 people views to 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 20,000, 50,000, and she had over 100,000 views. I'm like, what does that mean? And I was like, oh, crap, <laughs> you had over 100,000 view your 100,000 people view your your TikTok video. That's actually really good. So so on the yeah, on the, an achievement. Yeah, on the note of like helping people out and the, this is kind of like how it backfires. So one time my wife and my uh, my sister-in-law were at the house and there was this TikTok going around where basically uh, the lady, like one of the, one of the girls stands up and is like, I, I decided, you know, I'm going to try to make, you know, lose weight. And then it fast forwards. And, and then, uh, the girl has lost all her weight. And, but in the background is the original sister walking in the background, eating a bag of chips. So it was just like the sisters look alike, but one of them, you know, <laughs> weighs a little bit more than the other. So we had done this video at my house with my sister-in-law and my wife. And we, we, we put, I remember sitting there recording it. And then my sister-in-law put it up on TikTok. And it ended up getting like something crazy, like like six million views. And now, uh, if you go out to Instagram and you see like weight loss ads, it's the video. Like they don't even have a clue that it's not real, right? But they there's like in play games as well, like on Facebook that will have the video. I don't know how many how many millions of times that this has been seen, but I believe that we have zero recourse because if you put something up on TikTok. Right. You can get monetized from there, but from there they can share it out and do whatever they want. So it's on Facebook, it's on Instagram, and they're constantly getting tagged all the time. Like, is this you guys? And they're like, yep, that's us. We we make zero from it. I think my sister-in-law made like, uh, well, I'm not going to mention, but she did make some money off of it, but not a lot to retire, that's for sure. 
I remember there was some con- controversy. I think there's actually a court case because someone was taking people's public Instagram posts, like printing them on canvas and selling them as their own art. And it's as well, are you the original owner? You're not the original owner. This is in the public domain. I don't remember what happened to that court case, but it'll be interesting to, to look up. We continue to get great comments about our dad joke of the week. Dad joke of the week. This week, our guest Matt is up. You know, dad jokes are timely, right? And I don't have one for this particular segment. My two go-tos are anytime my kids get hurt, I always ask them if their face hurts. And they're always like, no. And I'm like, but it's killing me, right? So that's my go-to. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's a good one. <laughs> Love that one. That's a great dad joke. You got an upvote on that for me. All right, to wrap things up, cyber criminals are getting arrested, and we hope this leads to a drop in cybercrime. Proton Mail can no longer advertise they do not collect their users' IP addresses. Apple patched a dangerous zero day, but the sky is not falling. That's all we have for this week. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. You can find us all on LinkedIn. Links will be in the description. Follow us on Instagram at PebCAC Podcast. You can help us grow the podcast by telling somebody else about it. And thank you to all our listeners who rated us five stars in the iTunes store and left us a review. We appreciate you all spreading the word to help grow. The best way to find us is to search for the PebCAC podcast on your favorite podcast listening app. For my co-hosts Brian Deach and Glenn Medina and our guest Matt Disher, I'm Chris Louie. Thanks for listening. We'll see you all next week. And as always, have a nice day. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Talk to you next week. Later, boys. See ya. You need to be the techno Viking for Halloween there, Deej. <laughs> that's your, that's your, needs to be your go-to. Put that period. <laughs> <laughs>